Welcome. Uh, you are in the Evergreen Ballroom A, uh, and I'm here to introduce our next speaker. Uh, first off, just a quick housekeeping note. Uh, lunch is going to be in the Grand Ballroom as opposed to yesterday, which was in the Regency Ballroom. So take the escalators up, and I believe you hang a right. Uh, and hopefully it's a little bit bigger of a space. So uh, head on up there after this. Uh, so to my left, we have our next presenter, uh, Magda Balazinska. Uh, she's from the University of Washington and the Computer Science and Engineering Department. Uh, her current research focuses uh, include big data management, sensor and scientific data management, and cloud computing. And she holds a PhD from MIT. And I'll go ahead and hand it off to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, coming. Uh, what I would like to do today is actually talk about some of the research that we are doing in the computer science and engineering department, specifically in the database group. Uh, so first, can you hear me well in the back? Okay, great. Uh, so with my students and collaborators, I'm really working along three dimensions of data management. First, as you all know, everyone today has large amounts of data. Everyone is talking about big data. Since we are database, systems people, uh, we are thinking about how should we be building the next generation of systems to make it easier for people to manage and analyze uh, their, you know, uh, their data. And how can we do this if we are going to run these systems at cloud services? So we don't want people to install anything, just use these uh, systems. And I'm actually not going to talk about the details of, uh, of that work, but I invite you to visit our website, especially the Miria project, which is our own new parallel data management system and also service that we have uh, been building uh, and, have, um, uh, and are using uh, as our platform for research. What I want to talk about today is kind of a complementary aspect, which is so it's great that we have all these uh, big data management tools, but they're still not as easy to use as we would like them to be. So we are not HCI people, but still, what tools should we be building on top of data management systems so that it's actually a lot more intuitive and easy for anyone to, uh, to manage their data? Uh, the third topic, which I'm not going to discuss, but I'm happy to talk about offline, is related to managing data that has value. There's increasingly many people who are in companies buying and selling data online. What support should we be providing from the perspective of the database? For example, if a seller defines some price points on the data, can we automatically derive the price to pay for an arbitrary query? If someone sells a data set and it comes with license agreements, can we automatically enforce these license agreements in the database? So there are many interesting topics. It's definitely a good time to do research in data management. But today, let's focus on the second topic, which is how do we make uh, the management of big data easier? And this really starts with the user. So we have a user, a data scientist, that has some data to analyze. So what the user is interested in is just to start to ask questions on the data, but as it's common today, the data may not fit on their laptop, it may not fit in just, you know, using Excel. So the user is going to start and think about the cloud. There are many services today that uh, the user can use in the cloud. Amazon Web Services, uh, Google BigQuery, uh, uh, and so on. But the first problem is, of course, which service to use. So what the user is worrying about are things like the price. So depending on the service that I use, how much is it going to cost me to analyze my data? Will I incur any unexpected uh, expenses? We actually had this uh, happen to us on campus where we were running some experiments and a student by mistake, after one week, accumulated $30,000 of uh, charges, uh, which was, uh, <laughs> and here we thank Amazon.com for bailing us out. We are researchers and they came and helped us. Uh, but so this is a big problem. Uh, the second problem are uh, capabilities. Uh, if the user is going to use one of those uh, services online, uh, will it support all the features that the user needs to ask the kind of questions uh, that we want to ask? And finally, performance. Different systems and different configurations are going to have drastically different runtimes. The user has to decide if the runtime is exactly what he or she needs. So those are the questions that the user has. But today, if you go and try to use Amazon Web Services, Google BigQuery, these are great, great systems, but they make it very difficult to answer these questions. So in particular, if the user comes and says, well, maybe I'm going to use EC2 and I'm going to use SQL Server. Well, here there's a price, a per hour price for an instance. The user can decide, should I use a small instance, a medium instance, a large instance. The price is different, the performance will be different, but really the user has no idea what uh, he or she should pick. Uh, there are also other choices. We could go with Amazon Elastic MapReduce, which gives us access to a cluster of machine. 
there's a different price, price per machine, and you can change and pick any cluster size easily between up to 20 machines, uh, more if necessary. So it's unclear, does the user need this kind of performance? Is it going to be better than a SQL Server instance on a large, maybe, uh, Amazon uh, instance? Uh, the BigQuery system has yet a different pricing model. They will say, just upload your data, and we will charge per terabyte processed every time a query runs. But if I'm a user, it's hard for me to predict how much data will each query, um, query actually consume. So what we have is we really have a mismatch between the way the users are thinking about the problem, what is my total price, the capabilities, the performance, and this resource-centric perspective of these uh, cloud services that say, yes, you can come and use the service, but tell us how, much, uh, how many resources do you want. Do you want a certain number of machines, what sizes of machines, and so on. So what can we do about this? So in our group, we decided to tackle this problem and say, no, no, we need to rethink this interface between clouds and users. And we have developed what we call personalized service level agreements. So the idea of our approach is the following. The user just comes and she just uploads her data and says, here's my data. What the cloud can do is then look at the data and say, okay, I see the data that you just uploaded. Given my resources and my capabilities and given your data, I can give you a certain number of options. For a certain fixed price per hour, I can, uh, I can basically deliver a certain kind of performance for certain types of queries. If you're willing to pay more, then maybe the same queries can go a little bit faster. So these sets of options are what we call personalized service level agreements. So here's one concrete example of this personalized service <coughs> level agreement. Imagine that the user uploaded a data set. What the cloud is showing here are three tiers. So we have one tier here, another one here, another one here. This is a small, this is a, just an illustrative example. Typically there's a bit more information than that. So each tier comes with a fixed hourly price. So no surprises, if we pick a tier, we have a fixed price per hour, period. And what can we get for that price? Well, here we are going to uh, give the user two things. First, we will say, here's the expected performance. So if we pick, for example, this uh, tier, I can see right away that some queries can go fast. They are expected to complete within 20 seconds, and other queries will be slower. They will take up to 10 minutes. Versus if I am willing to pay more, then maybe my run times are expected to be much faster. This is extremely helpful to me, because then I can really uh, see the trade-off. Should I pay more because I need the performance? Or is it okay for me to wait a little bit and then pay less uh, on average? And of course, we have to see, well, what can I do? What do I get uh, to run at that, uh, at that speed? So here we have actually the queries that the user can execute, but we cannot list all the possible queries, so we give templates. So in this example, we say if you have your main facts table, perhaps the cells that you have been doing this month, and you have the dimensions that describe different uh, facets of these cells, well, joining in, oops, in this tier, uh, any query that joins the facts table with just one dimension table, we know that it's going to run within five seconds. But if you want to maybe combine facts with multiple dimensions, those queries will be more expensive. So as the user, this gives me a really good idea. If I just want to do simple queries on top of the data, maybe I don't have to pay much. I can go with the cheapest tier and I will get good performance. If I want the more complicated queries and I definitely want to run fast, maybe I want to pay more. And in this example, we illustrate the fact that maybe uh, in some cases going to an even more expensive tier might actually not be worthwhile for the user. So this is nice because it really brings together the two perspectives. The user can see really their options in terms of prices per hour, capabilities, and, um, uh, and run times. So the challenge, of course, the research challenge, is how do we generate these personalized service level agreements uh, automatically? And there are three components to this challenge. The first component is that, well, the user just shows us their data. They don't necessarily know exactly the queries they want to run on the data. So we have to come up with a set of representative queries that we will use to generate the templates. So we have to generate representative queries from the data. Second, we need a way to estimate the run times for these queries, which is a hard problem. And finally, once we have queries and run times, we need to somehow organize them to create these, uh, these service tiers. So let me give you a, kind of few uh, pieces of information about these, um, these three components. So in our system, we take the data that the user produces, we generate uh, representative queries, we predict their performance, and then we're going to organize the result into uh, these service tiers. So for the workload generation, if a user gives us a database 
uh, in terms of you know, uh, maybe a fact table, multiple dimensions table, or some other set of tables, I can really compose as many queries as I want on top, of this data, uh, on top of this data. But if I generate too many queries, well, what I'm going to show to the user can be really overwhelming. So what we decided to do is really start from simple queries and show the user what kind of performance and price to get for simple queries and build them up incrementally towards more complicated ones. So what we are going to do is definitely first look at queries that only select certain number of rows from the table or that select certain columns. Those are the simplest queries we can write. Then we start to look at what if I want to join, right, combine tables together, and we grow these incrementally. So that is going to give us the different patterns of queries that we want to show to the user. But the question is, for each such pattern, if I say maybe a facts table joins one or two dimensions tables, there are many concrete instances of this pattern that we can get. So the question is, which of these instances should we use in our system when we do the runtime prediction? So here what we do is, of all the possible ways to instantiate a pattern, we use the one that will actually process the largest amount of data. So if we say combine facts with one dimension, we will join facts with the largest dimension table because the expectation is that this is going to be a more expensive operation than joining the facts table with a smaller dimensions table. And since in our PSLA, we're going to show the expected performance, we prefer to show higher uh, kind of runtime than a lower runtime. So that's what we do for generating a kind of a representative workload. The second point is, okay, so now I have the data set that the user wants to analyze, and we have a method to generate a representative set of queries. How do we actually estimate the runtime? So here we use a technique from the literature, and the idea is to build a model using machine learning where we take a query, we transform each query into a feature vector. So we will say for this query, how many of each kind of operation does it contain? How much data do we expect it to produce? How much data do we expect it to shuffle across the network? These kinds of features. And then we build a model that for each configuration of cloud resources that we are considering, we're going to map this feature vector to a runtime. And we build this model offline. And of course, the more accurate the model, the more accurate our PSLAs are going to be. But notice that we are in a good position that we don't need a perfectly accurate model. If our model says for this query, I predict that it's going to take five minutes to run. But in practice, the query takes three minutes to run. This is a big mistake in terms of prediction. But it's still useful for PSLAs because if a user says, you know, I expect it to take five minutes, it takes three minutes, it's st still the same kind of order of magnitude. So it's still very useful information. So this is what we can get so far. So this is already useful. So if you can see in this graph, we have three configurations of the cloud service. So we took Amazon and are looking at a small instance, medium instance, or a large instance running SQL Server. And if I have these three configurations, we take a data set, um, and we can generate queries, and we can say for all the queries that we generated, here are the runtimes that we estimate for these queries for each of these configurations. This is already useful. So I can, by kind of seeing the spread, I can see that if I pick a small instance, uh, I will probably have very high runtimes. So if I want to do some kind of complex analysis, if I pick the medium instance, instance I get much better runtimes. And for the largest one, I don't really get that much of an improvement. But the problem is that at this point, if I say, well, maybe I just want to run certain types of queries, I don't know. So I don't know what kinds of queries are here, and I don't know what kinds of queries are uh, the expensive ones. So what we want to do is now take these queries that we have, these runtime predictions, and organize them into uh, these, uh, the actual uh, PSLA service tiers. How are we going to do this? So we do this in several steps. The first step is that we run a clustering algorithm to cluster queries that have similar runtimes together. And we will use these clusters to set our thresholds. Those are the runtimes that we are going to uh, show to the users. We expect these queries to complete within this time, which is our expected time. These queries, we expect them to complete within this time. So this is already useful, but I still have this long list of queries. So what we do next is for each of these clusters, we only pick representative queries. And the idea is that some queries are more complicated than others. If, for example, here, I have a query that says, select a certain number of rows from the table. And I have another query that says, take this table, join it with another one, and then select a certain number of rows. Where the first query is strictly simpler and faster than the second one, 
So I can eliminate the first one and only keep the second one. And from that second query, we can generate uh, the actual query templates. So let me show you kind of a real example. So this is a real example of a PSLA generated by our system. So what we did here is we took a reasonably small data set. It's a 10 gigabyte data set. It comes from a standard benchmark called a TPC H benchmark. And what we did is we looked at the queries. We took this data set. We generated representative queries. And we looked at three service tiers. Again, we are looking here uh, at Amazon, uh, three instance sizes, uh, small, medium, and large. So what you can see is you can already see that for we have the small, medium, and large. And we see the run times. So I can already see that with this PSLA, certain queries are going to take less than 10 seconds. And other que queries are going to be as slow as one hour. And here we have those templates that are going to show us exactly what queries uh, are running at each uh, runtime. You cannot see it from the back, but if you look at them closely, there are three types of queries. The templates at the bottom show that if you, all we want is select subsets of rows and columns, I have a data set and I just want to see what the data contains. Then these, I don't have to pay much. I can pick the small instance and these queries are expected to run within 10 seconds. So if that's what I want to do, here's my answer. This is the tier that I should uh, use. Uh, if I want to use small joints, so small joints because I join a small number of tables together, or because I join many tables together, but I'm going to actually filter away a lot of the rows. So all these small joints are going to be slower, uh, but they're still going to be uh, you know, within a few minutes. And these are the big joints that are going to take much longer, possibly up to an hour. So if I'm interested in running these more complicated analysis tasks, this is where I definitely probably want to invest and pay more because these are much faster already for the medium instance and can be even a little bit more uh, faster for uh, the large instance. So this is exciting because with this technique, and I know this is just kind of a high level overview, uh, what we can do is instead of having the user come to the cloud service and have to choose how many machines they want to use, what size machines, they can come to the cloud service they show us their data, and we can tell them, on your data specifically, you can run these kinds of queries and get these expected query run times in these different service tiers. So this really brings kind of together much better the user's perspective uh, with what the cloud can offer. Does that make sense? So feel free to ask questions, and I'm also going to kind of try to leave questions, uh, time for questions at the end. So are we done? So have we solved the problem of making big data management easy? Well, this is one component of the problem, right? The fact that we want to make it easy for users to select services and their configurations. But this is not the only thing. So the second problem is good. So now I have picked a service, but as I'm showing, I have to write these SQL queries. And writing SQL queries is not necessarily a trivial thing to do. Even if you know data scientists are highly qualified people, they're technically skilled, uh, they know basic select from where, but it's still not easy to articulate SQL queries. What can we do to help people in that aspect? Uh, so here, uh, we have developed a second system called Steep Suggest, and let me tell you about that system through an example. So our example was actually motivated by collaborations with astronomers. So in astronomy, they have something called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which was a survey that basically surveyed and took pictures of the sky for 10 years. They accumulated this gigantic database of telescope images. From these telescope images, they extracted sources, so stars, galaxies that they found, and they built these large catalogs. And these catalogs are available online, and people can run SQL queries to extract the data that they need. So this is extremely useful, and there have been thousands, I think something like 9,000 papers, although I'm not sure what the exact number, written using this data. So an amazingly rich data set, very, very useful, but we need to, we want to run SQL queries to access the data. So let's imagine we have this astronomer, and he wants to find stars uh, that have a certain brightness and are also near another, uh, kind of at a specific location uh, in the sky. So. This astronomer knows that he probably needs to try to select from where kind of query. He knows a little bit of SQL, but it's still not easy. If you look at the Sloan Digital Sky Survey schema, it has some 88 tables, right? 51 views, 200 user-defined functions, more than 3,000 columns. So where do I even start? It's really not easy. And the second thing, there's some predicates, like how do I express near a star? How does that translate into SQL? Uh, how about certain brightness? How does that translate into SQL? So even though we know SQL, uh, the databases are large, 
uh, and the, some of these predicates are specialized. But clearly, Joe is not the first person querying this data. So someone before probably has already an answer to this problem. So what can we do? Well, definitely we can look at the sample queries. Uh, and sample queries are very useful to get started, but they might not actually contain exactly what we need. So sample queries are limited. The second thing we can do is just a keyword search over all the queries that people have asked before us in the past. The problem is that there's more than 100 million queries, and some of them could be ill-formed, some of them just are just difficult to understand. This is also not easy. So what do we do? Well, we can actually leverage this repository of queries, but we can help the user by being more clever about what information we show them from this log. So what our system does, let me actually show you a concrete, concrete example of what the, our system will produce. We let the user start to type their query. So the user will say, okay, this is a SQL query, so I'm going to say from this table called photo primary, I know this is the main table used in the system, uh, I know I need to select something from that table, but can you help me? Well, if the uh, user starts to type the beginning of uh, his SQL query and asks for recommendations, actually our system is going to recommend, as I think the number, this was the third recommendation that our system does, was to use this uh, user-defined function that is called get nearby objects. Give a location, you get all the objects that are near this location. And this is exactly what we want here. So all we have to do is to fill in the number. And why do we know to recommend this? Because it's actually something that is very popular. Typically, users before us who were accessing this table very frequently were using this user-defined function as well. And now that we have this information and the user selected it, we know even more about what the user can do. So of course, the first thing we can do is to combine and add the joint predicate to say, you want the objects from the photo primary table that are also returned by this function. So we can do that and that's an easy thing to do. But what is exciting is if the user asks for more recommendations here, the fifth recommendation that we produce is actually a predicate that says, so you found these objects in this table. Uh, so we expect that you probably want to look at this attribute ca called R uh, and uh, have some you know, selection predicates on that attribute. For us who are not astronomers, this is mysterious. Like, Why would I want to do this? But this is actually the predicate that does the selection on the brightness. And it's something that is, again, very popular in this specific domain on this specific data set. So what is exciting is as the user writes a query on a specific data set, our system can produce recommendations that are targeted at that domain because we are looking at the other queries uh, from that domain. And you may ask, why is this the fifth recommendation? Well, the first recommendation that we produce are actually further predicates on the location of the object, which, as you can imagine, in other contexts are also very useful. So the question is, of course, how do we go about producing these recommendations? So let me give you a quick overview of our approach. So the idea is that we are going to uh, start from a database that is some kind of community database, many users. They are all uh, running queries on the database. Uh, and we are going to accumulate their queries. So here I'm switching from astronomy to kind of more of an illustrative example that imagine we have a log, and in that log, 30 times we have the first query, 10 times the second query, and so on. So we have this really long log of all the queries that people have asked in the past. We are going to parse these queries and extract SQL snippets so small snippets from their queries, such as we are going to uh, have one feature for each table that appears in the from clause. We are going to have one feature or one of those snippets for each predicate that appears in the where clause, uh, for each column selected in the select clause. So once we have this, now our queries are these f vectors of features. And what we can do is we can organize them conceptually into this, uh, the, into this graph where at the top we have, this is the empty query, blank page. Someone has not written anything. Uh, and then each of the nodes is going to be uh, any valid combination of features. So a query that selects everything from table C, a query that selects everything from table B. This is a query that selects from table B only uh, tuples that uh, satisfy this predicate. So what we can do is we have these features that look at everything in the from clause and everything in the where clause, everything in the select clause. And for each valid combination, we have a node in the graph. 
And the blue nodes are the ones that actually appear in the query log. So these are queries that someone has actually submitted. The other ones no one has submitted, but they are nevertheless valid queries. And what we can do is we can connect them. Each edge in this graph means we are adding one feature. So as you can imagine now, for example, to write this blue query here, what I can do is I can start at the top and I can first add a table to the from clause, then add a predicate to the where clause, and then add yet another predicate. So each edge means adding a little bit of SQL to my query. So this is something we can build and we don't actually build the graph, but this is a conceptual graph that organizes this query log uh, showing how the different queries relate to each other, how we can go from one query and modify it piece by piece and get to a second query. Can I ask a question? Yes. So do you evaluate the logs, that history of logs, in real time, or do you produce this, this graph and then re just reuse that, that graph? Like, is it constantly changing? So we don't produce the graph. So basically, when the user asks for a recommendation, we mostly just run other SQL queries on the log at that time okay. to compute some statistics. Okay. Uh, because what happens actually, so this is a good question, what is happening, and I'm sorry for the, the font here, this is 0.33, is that we, if we look at the log, we can say, so if a query contains the B table in the from clause, what is the probability that this query will also have this predicate? So here we are going to look at all the blue nodes and say, uh, in our query log, 33% of the queries that had the B table in the from clause also had this predicate. So each arrow has this conditional probability that if I'm already at that node, how likely am I uh, in the query log to also use one of these other features? And we have this for each edge. But again, we don't pre-compute it ahead of time. So now when the user is somewhere and says, I started to type select from C, please recommend something for me, what we will do is we're going to look at these conditional probabilities and says in the log, 78% of the queries that had the C table in the from clause also had this predicate, so we are going to output that as the first recommendation. And we can uh, similarly kind of output the second most likely feature. And what is really nice is that as the user goes down and has articulated a bigger fraction of their query, we can uh, produce more specialized recommendations for them. And this is exactly the technique we use to produce the recommendations in the example. So this is kind of, uh, the system as a whole is called SNP Suggest, and this is our system for producing these recommendations and really helping people articulate these SQL queries. Any other questions so far? So this is exciting. What is really exciting is that we take a user who has a data set. The first thing we, di we did for the user is to say, don't worry about picking resources. We look at your data and we can tell you what the cloud service can do for you if you're willing to pay different prices. Now that the user has picked a service, we can say, please start to write your SQL query. Uh, if other users have analyzed the same data set, we can actually see what they have done and show you what are the popular features. So the goal here is not so much to help the expert, because experts know what queries they want to write, but any kind of new data scientist who joins the team, they don't have to go and ask all these questions. We can help them get uh, productive faster, because we can show them what others have been using in similar contexts. So are we done? And actually, we're not done yet. So the third problem is sometimes now users have their service, they run their query, and the query is just takes a bizarre amount of time. And this is actually something that was uh, happening to us when we were using Hadoop. So this third project was done in the specific context of Hadoop, where we would run these uh, Hadoop jobs on a cluster, and sometimes they would not run for the amount of time we expected. And the question was, of course, why? So we said, well, if this is a problem for us, it's probably a problem in more generally. So why don't we build a system that is going to help us answer these performance questions? So the idea here, the system is called PerfExplain, that we're going to take as input a log of MapReduce jobs executed on the cluster before, and a query from a, a user expressed on top of, uh, of this log, and we're going to generate explanations. So how can we do this? So the first question to ask was, what should we write? If I have a performance query, how do I articulate this performance query? What should it be on? And the first thing we decided was, well, if a user comes to the system and says, why was this job so slow? Me as the system, I can say slow. What do you mean slow? I think it was pretty fast. 
because it's relative, right? So it's very hard to answer questions of the form, kind of absolute performance questions. It's much easier if the user says, well, why was this job so much slower than this other job, even though they process the same amount of data, for example? Well, that's something we can start to try to explain. So we decided in the system to focus on these relative performance questions. So what the user will say is the user will ask us about why was one runtime of a job or a task slower or faster or similar to the other one. And we will try to produce explanations. To produce explanations, we need to have some, again, features of these jobs. So what we did is we're going to look at the log of past jobs, job executions, and we're going to look at all the pairs of jobs because all the explanations are relative. So we will look at all the pairs, and we are going to accumulate features. So what we are going to look at are the job parameters. How many reduced tasks were in this job? Were there any other interesting uh, parameters? How about the data? How much data was processed? Anything else interesting about the data? Uh, how was the cluster set? What was the cluster size? What was the block size set to? What were the other parameters set to? And what was the load? Is the system heavily loaded when it's executed or not? And this is something we can extend, but we try to start with a good set of features that really capture what was going on in the system. What was the cluster like? How was the load? What did the user actually run? And what data did the user process? So we started by collecting these features, and we put them in a table, and we tried to generate explanations. And the explanation would come back and say, because this job processed 32 gigabytes of data, and because you were running on 53 instances, something happened. And we said, well, does it matter that it was 53 as opposed to 52? Right? So the explanations were just very so precise that it was very hard to generalize from them. So we concluded that the first step was to have some more general features. So what we did is we actually put all the jobs in this table, so all the pairs, and we have three types of features. Uh, we are going to keep these low, lowest level features because sometimes it does matter that a specific value was used. But we also use higher level features. Uh, so we are going to use uh, the highest level feature will be, was this value the same or different for the two jobs? So the, did these two jobs execute on the same number of instances or on a different number of instances? Because sometimes it's enough to say, well, because they were executing on the same number of instances and the block size was set to a different value, something happened. So that would be the highest level. If I don't care about the value, do I just care that something was the same or different? And if it was different, maybe I don't care directly about the exact value, but I just care that something was just much greater than, or similar, or much less than. Or in the case of categorical values, what the value changed from and to between the two, uh, the two jobs. So these are going to be our features. And that's what we collect offline before the user asks any questions. So the second thing is now the user can ask a question. So the questions are, again, declarative. So the user doesn't have to write any, uh, any code. They just ask and basically give us three predicates over the features in this table. The first, the user will say, what did the user observe? And this observed predicate is a predicate of the runtime. I observed that the runtime was uh, similar. What did the user expect? Uh, I expected maybe the runtime of one job to be much faster than the runtime of the other job. And here there's a, a other clause that says despite. So I observed certain behavior, I expected another behavior, and I can say, why did I expect this other behavior? Because I used a larger number of instances, I expected the runtime to go down. And that despite clause helps us uh, produce more relevant explanations. So here's one example that actually happened to us in practice. So what we had is we had a, a job. You know, you already write your script, try it on a sample data set. We run it, and the results were not what we expected. Uh, and I think it started by being some 30 gigabytes of data. So we said, let's cut it down to just one gigabyte, rerun it so it will be faster for us to debug. Bigger than our small sample, so hopefully the error actually uh, manifests itself, but small enough that it will go faster. Uh, so you know, 30 times less data should go 30 times faster. But in fact, uh, it took the same amount of time. And here we were puzzled. So we asked a query that says, uh, we expected uh, the duration of this full run to be much greater than the duration of the debug run. That's what we expected. We observed that it was uh, similar. And why did we expect it to, to be different? Well, because the input size was much larger, much larger for, um, uh, for the second job. 
So we asked this question. Any guesses as to why we were seeing the same runtime? So uh, indexing could have been the problem. In this case, what was happening is we had a very large block size. So even though the cluster had 20 or 30 machines, we were not using all these machines. So in both cases, we were not leveraging the full degree of parallelism available. We had these kind of small, big serial chunks. And the answer was make your chunks that are serial smaller so you can have many of them in parallel. And that's actually what, the user, what our uh, system returned as the explanation. So here's the explanation returned by the system that says, uh, the block size was actually very large. And it also said, this is uh, shortened for the uh, slide, but it actually says the block size was large and the cluster was large. Because if the cluster had been only one machine, we would not have seen this, uh, this effect. Or, I mean, a few machines, two or three machines. And it also made the uh, despite clause bigger. So what is interesting is how do we actually generate these, uh, these explanations? So the idea behind generating these explanations is that we start from our log of, of jobs and we are going to grow these explanation clauses one uh, predicate at a time. So what we are going to do is we say, okay, so the user wants an explanation. So first, let me only look at the pairs of jobs that satisfy either the observed clause or the expected clause. Anything else is irrelevant. Then among this group of uh, jobs, what I'm going to try is find a because clause that if it is satisfied, it really maximizes the probability of this behavior in the whole t uh, group. But what is interesting, is so if I really have a very high probability of seeing the observed behavior when a pair of jobs satisfies the because clause, I will have a very precise explanation. The problem is if that's all I'm optimizing for, the explanation will come back and say, because you executed this job at 3.03 PM on March 23rd, you saw this behavior. This is a very precise explanation. There was only one execution like that, and it satisfies the clause, and hence this is a precise explanation. But, but of course, it's not very useful because this because clause only applies to that one pair. So what we want is we want both an explanation that is precise, but also an explanation that is general. So that if I don't look at the observed or expected, the general probability of any pair of jobs satisfying the because clause to be high. So we want to generate a clause that uh, is general, so many, many pairs satisfy the predicate, but the probability of the observed behavior is high when the because clause is satisfied. So this is good for the because clause, but how about the uh, despite clause? Why do we need it? So the problem is that when we were only generating because clauses, we often were actually generating irrelevant explanations. If the user, like when we initially asked and said, I expected the runtime to be the same, but I observed that it was greater than, no, sorry, I expected it to be greater than, but I saw that it was the same. Why? Well, we will say it was the same because you run it on the same number of instances. Because in general, when two jobs that process, you know, uh, that run the same script, run on the same number of instances, in our log very frequently, they actually have the same runtime. But in this case, this is not a useful explanation. That's not the reason. But when we add the despite clause, and the despite clause, it says all the reasons why we should have seen the expected behavior, that allows us to um, kind of ignore all these irrelevant cases. So here we say, uh, despite the fact that the input size was greater than, which means if I only look at the pairs of job where one is processing more data than the other, only look at these pairs. And in that context, tell me why, when one job processes more data than the other one, I still sometimes have the same runtime. Well, here we eliminate the reason of a number of instances being the same. Because typically, if one processes more data than the other one, uh, this is not the explanation. So this is the reason why we have this uh, despite clause. Uh, so, uh, and this is kind of the third component, which is this uh, perfect explain technique. So all three of these. Uh, approaches, perfect explain, SNP suggest, and the personalized service level agreements uh, have more details in our papers, and I'll be happy to refer to you uh, to those papers uh, offline. What is exciting, I think, is uh, you may ask, are we done now? I don't think we are done. I think there's just so much more that we can do to make it easier for people to uh, manage their data, especially today that the data is so large, we cannot simply use Excel. There are also a lot of work done by other people in that same space. It's just an exciting opportunity where we can say, we have these large data sets, 
large amounts of skilled users who want to analyze them, what are the right tools? We definitely want them to analyze their data fast, so we should spend a lot of time building systems that are very fast and efficient, but at the same time, we have to think about the tools that people will actually use on top of these systems to analyze the data and, uh, and make sense of it uh, in a way that's uh, easier than having to do, you know, uh, spend years and years uh, building up experience. We want people to be fast and efficient uh, quickly. And let me just kind of uh, uh, finish with the acknowledgement slide. So this is, of course, great work done by uh, my students. The main two students have already graduated and have taken on uh, great jobs. Uh, so we're very proud of them. And also thank you to uh, our sponsors. And thank you all for your attention. I'll be happy to take more questions. Thank you. Oh, so this is a great idea. So at this point, everything has been published. Uh, for the uh, Snip Suggest paper, we actually did an experiment and tried to file a patent for it. So we have a patent pending, because it seems like such a nice thing that many commercial companies might want to add. Uh, but the rest is actually open. Uh, it's not commercialized, and we don't have any intentions at this point. So if you are interested in implementing that in your system, uh, this is something we'd be happy to, uh, to help with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're in academia. We like people uh, <laughs> to just take our things and do stuff. We just want to be famous. We know we will be poor. Uh. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. So, I'm, I'm sorry, I was late to the presentation of you. I talked about this, but would SNP suggest if you were to implement it on uh, our Oracle's uh, server, uh -huh. how, how does that architecture work? So, it's actually uh, the integration is pretty easy because we don't really need um, anything from the engine itself. So we need to take the query, we parse the query, so it would be good to reuse the parser. And from the parser, we extract all these features, which are the tables in the from clause, the predicates in the where clause. So what we want is to take the output of the parser to be able to have all these features. And uh, we need to enable logging. So Oracle already has logging uh, for queries. So just enable logging so the queries get logged parse the queries using the parser to extract the features. And once we have the table with the features, we mostly just execute SQL queries that compute the statistics. So the implementation is actually not that uh, hard. So I think the integration will be pretty smooth. So, and I'd be happy to, to talk more offline. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the, as far as the semantics of the query, there's no attempt to determine whether or not a particular suggested snippet was actually a good piece of SQL. So it definitely, you know, it, it is, we only recommend valid SQL. So we're going to check that if, for example, a table does not appear in the from clause, we uh, will not recommend a predicate in the where clause. So we only recommend snippets that are valid uh, at this point. So definitely what, we, what will result will be a valid query. Useful, it depends on the user. We know that this is popular in the context of something similar. Mm -hmm. Yes? And with regards to the to particular style of, at which the uh -huh. suggestions are made, so I saw the style was such where you were joining the, the tables were joined in the where in the yes. where predicate uh, where I'm very used to joining uh, using the uh, Join. from on uh -huh, uh -huh. So at this point, we did not. This is just, uh, that was kind of a research prototype, so we did not look at uh, these different variants. But this is something we definitely could uh, recommend because we can identify when things are similar to each other. Um, Right? Because in both cases, this ends up being the joint predicate. Uh, they're just expressed differently at the syntax level. So the idea here would be to get the, um, I think we could probably do it with a setting, because we can uh, parse queries and have a feature vector that is independent of the exact syntax. And when we go back and generate the syntax, like the, you know, the string version of it, we could generate one or the other. So we could definitely do that, but that's something that would be, that's why it's from prototype to natural implementation. Right. There's still a step. Yeah. But you guys in industry do that. <laughs> Other questions? When yes. you uh, look at your uh, snippet, uh, did you think about waiting, like identifying who are the good queriers and waiting their queries higher in the recommendation than somebody that didn't? 
So that's a very good question. At this point, we do not put weights between users, but we do have one technique that is really nice and I did not mention here. When we have a really long log, there are many queries and some of them can be like intermediate queries that someone was in the middle of writing and it's actually not a good query. So what we do is we have another technique that looks at the log and looks at all the uh, consecutive pairs of queries by the same user and we have a classifier that determines whether one is a continuation of the previous query and then we kind of rebuild the sessions and the user can go away or they can work on another query and then come back so then we take these sessions we stitch them together and then you can see the user really started from this, this query and in the end ended up with that query and what we can do is we can remove all these queries from the log and only look at those final queries to produce recommendations and that does improve performance because we have fewer queries and quality because we keep the better queries but we do not have weights between users it's something we could uh, probably add as well Yeah, yeah. That's right, that's right, but we don't have that yet. All right, any last question before lunch? Using the word lunch is the best way to make sure there's no more. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks again, everyone. Uh,